Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation titled Tips for Managing Food Allergy in Schools. My name is Laura Bantock and I'm the Director of Education and Healthcare Initiatives here at Food Allergy Canada. I'm also a registered nurse and the parent of two young adults. It's my daughter that has food allergy and asthma. My presentation today will take about 30 minutes followed by a 30 minute question and answer period. But before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. In order to keep the audio as clear as possible, all participants are set on mute. I'll be answering questions after the presentation, so please type your questions into the question box that you can see on the control panel. Do this as they occur to you, and I'll answer as many as I can at the end. Also in the control panel, you'll see a resource sheet that you can download during the presentation. If you have a training device with you, and what I mean is an auto-injector training device, please have it ready and uh, you can go over the steps of using epinephrine during the presentation in the second half of um, our time together today. If you experience any technical difficulties, please go to www.gotowebinar.com for support and troubleshooting. Stephanie Von Dane is our coordinator out here in Western Canada and she's on the webinar with us today. She'll be helping me with the questions later on. Stephanie has two children, one daughter who has multiple food allergies and Stephanie worked previously as a medical social worker. Stephanie, would you like to say hello? Hi everyone, thanks for the introduction Laura and I look forward to addressing your questions at the end of the presentation. Great, so today I'm going to provide an overview of the tips for getting ready to go back to school with food allergy. And in the latter part of the presentation, as I said, I'll go over the symptoms and how to use epinephrine. So again, if you have a training device somewhere, you might like to walk through the steps of how to use an EpiPen with me. The contents of this presentation and related resources are for information purposes only. People should talk to their doctor about any concerns or questions they may have regarding their own health. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank and acknowledge Dr. Scott Cameron, who has reviewed this presentation for medical accuracy. Dr. Cameron is a pediatric allergist in Victoria, British Columbia, and he's a member of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. He's also a clinical instructor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology within the Pediatric Department at the University of British Columbia. It's really important to understand your setting. Managing food allergy should be based on the context of your school, the ages and stages of the children, common allergens, which allergens are being avoided in the classroom, and the structure of the school. Information such as the location of the school, amount of children, lunch rooms, classroom supervision, all play into the strategies needed to create a safer environment for your child. It is necessary to find ways to reduce the risk of exposure to their allergens and to learn about the policies at your child's daycare or at school. Food Allergy Canada has links on our website to policies across the country to help you learn about the policies at a provincial level. You should also look at school district and school level policies and these are typically online. If not, a simple phone call to the um, school district office will help you find this information. Consider all the variables every year and be flexible about how the approach may have to alter. For example, new staff, new students, and different stages of development. And planning around sports activities where students will go off site or travel with teams for longer field trips. This will represent additional challenges for food allergic students as sometimes these travel situations mean stops for food if traveling away for longer periods. There are two very relevant resources that you and your school community can utilize. The first is this publication called Anaphylaxis in Schools and Other Settings, which can be downloaded from our site. It has several resources such as sample letters, emergency plans, and information on policies across Canada. Allergy Aware, which is a free online training site, has three courses, one for the community, one for childcare settings, and one for schools. These are really engaging, interactive, and medically reviewed by a member of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. And you can get a certificate of completion by printing 
um, that can be printed after successfully completing the course. As I said, both of these resources capture the Canadian school context and are medically reviewed, so therefore they're completely relevant to childcare and school settings in Canada. Food Allergy Canada has two programs that could make your school aware of these and can help build awareness at school in a fun and engaging way. There's one for elementary schools and one for high schools and they're called the Allergy Challenge. There are games and competitions that promote awareness, education and support for students. You can find these on our website. Look for Food Allergy Canada Allergy Awareness Challenge under Programs and Services. Again, these are free and easy to download um, at any point. The day-to-day -day management of food allergy requires self-management and support from others. Everyone has a role to play. At home and in school, the management of food allergy is a responsibility that can be shared by the allergic child dependent on their age and maturity, their parents or guardians, school staff, and the entire school community. Every child with a food allergy at school or child care should have an individual plan. This form that you can see on the right hand side is from the publication I just mentioned, Anaphylaxis in Schools and Other Settings, but it's also available on our website and it outlines the following information. The child's name, the list of the allergens being avoided, their medications, including the dose and expiry dates, and whether the person has asthma or not. The signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis are also on this page, and the steps to take in an emergency and the step and the and the order in which they should occur are also there. Emergency contact information, how the school will contact you if an emergency occurs, and these can both be adapted for various locations such as childcare centers as well as schools. It's important to keep this information updated and to make sure this information is really available. Be aware of how this information is shared, however. It should be shared with those who need this information, but also be kept as confidential student information, so make sure it's not posted in a visible notice board, for example. Many teachers decide to keep these in their desk diary and also have access to medical file alerts for those who are computerized. In order to help protect your child, it's necessary to find ways to reduce the risk of exposure and to learn about the policies that exist at your specific daycare and your school. While it's important to provide a safe environment, it's simply not possible to eliminate every potential risk. So the term allergy aware refers to the ongoing actions that are needed to manage those risks, rather than the term allergy free, which implies a guarantee or that there is zero risk. We are often asked, what does allergy aware really mean? These are the ongoing strategies that help reduce the risk and create an allergy aware environment for your child. Planning ahead and making sure that you give the school all the pertinent information well ahead of the first day of school. Try and drop these off a week before when offices are usually open. Allergy aware means that responsible adults have been trained about how to reduce the risk, recognize an allergic reaction and how to intervene in an emergency. Ask the school administration about plans for education and training of responsible adults. For example, is it a public health nurse that will do the education session? Allergy aware means good communication with everyone in the child's community. Ask the school administration about ways that they typically communicate with the classroom community and the broader school community about awareness of food allergy. An example of this would be in school newsletters or at a parent information evening. Make sure that your child knows where the office is and has been introduced to key figures in the administration team. Children often feel more comfortable if they understand that the school office is a place that they can turn to if they need to seek adult attention. Allergy aware in the classroom will depend on several factors such as the allergens that are being avoided and the ages of the children general risk reduction strategies such as hand washing, common surface cleaning, and adult supervision are typical. I have a list on the following slide that goes over these. 
Most importantly, everyone should collaborate on strategies to reduce the risk of accidental exposure. They also need to be prepared to respond in an emergency situation. And the best way to prepare for this is to practice. This helps everyone slot into a familiar role and also helps reduce anxiety during a real emergency. Many schools use role playing to familiarize staff with the steps of the emergency plan and use of epinephrine. Here is a list showing the ways to reduce the risk in a classroom setting. Hand washing, having safe food items available with rules about not sharing foods or utensils, having medication available and identification in situations where a person may not be able to speak for themselves, involving everyone in food allergy education, including students, moving towards non-food related prizes or rewards in the classroom, and scheduling regular janitorial services to common surfaces. And very importantly, understanding the emergency protocol and being able to put it into action. If you are a parent or a caregiver, modeling clear, consistent behavior, for example, not accepting food from others on behalf of your child unless you've confirmed that it's safe, or planning ahead to have safe meal options or safe snacks readily available. These are important and they and your children will copy these attitudes and skills when they're older. And this is especially important as they will have to make their own choices about what's safe for them. Children grow quickly and as they mature, they will seek independence. The typical teenager does not want a parent hovering over them and, will not always, and you will not always be there to protect them. So adopting clear guidelines for behavior when they're young will help to pave the way for responsible behavior in the future. As a parent, if you know that your child understands how to make good decisions about their own allergy management, you will feel more confident about granting teenagers their much prized independence. Food Allergy Canada has two programs for children. One is called Allergy Pals, and this is for 7 to 11 year olds. And there is another one called Allergy Allies, which is for 12 to 15 year olds. And these help children build their community and learn strategies to manage their food allergy while away from home. There are also monthly webinars offered by trained peer mentors. This month the topic is on back to school and next month the topic is Halloween. You can find the registration information by looking at the events calendar on our website. Younger children need black and white rules. These should always be consistent and should have no exceptions. An example of what I mean is if the rule is no eating snacks mum and dad have not improved, then there cannot be a laundry list of exceptions, like except when they're given to you by your teacher or a friend's mother, etc. Only you should be introducing new foods into your child's diet. And this can extend into the school setting where new food items or sharing with a friend might be suggested to your child. Tell your child that they can call you anytime if there's any question about food and that there's any concern that they are not feeling well these are valid reasons to interrupt anyone. Make, it, make a clear distinction, however, that in the case of an allergic reaction emergency, they are to follow the plan, and we mean the emergency plan, and call you after epinephrine has been given and the emergency services have been summonsed. Tell the school or your childcare facility that if there's any question about a food and its safety, and if they're unable to reach you for clarification, they are not to feed your child under any circumstances until you can be consulted. A number of things can be done to reduce the risk of exposure at school. Children should be taught to wash their hands before and after eating, and only eat foods approved and provided by parents or guardians. Teach your child how to respond politely to adults when offered food. For example, no thank you, I can only eat what my mum or dad gives me. Teach your child to avoid the sharing of lunch, food or snacks, straws, utensils, food containers with their friends and their family. Children should wear medical alert identification jewelry or similar type of wearable identification. There's several options on the market. And carry up enough from when they're mature enough to do so. Help your child to tell others about what foods they need to avoid and where their auto injector is kept. 
create a family rule to always have epinephrine available at all times. In situation where there is no epinephrine, the rule should be no food. For school-aged children, you can explain the steps of an emergency plan, including practicing with a training device. Children do much better and experience less fear when they know what to expect. A great resource for older children and teenagers to learn more is Food Allergy Canada's Ultimate Guidebook for Teens with Food Allergy. I really love this book. It's full of real advice, stories, and tips. And it's written by members of Food Allergy Canada's Youth Advisory Panel. So by teenagers and young adults for this specific audience. You can find information on our website about this book, including a free flipbook version. Talk to the school administration about a communication piece to the larger school community. It's helpful if everyone, including children and adults with reasonable authority, understand common allergen rules, such as children should only eat what's supplied to them by their parents or their guardians, and this will support risk reduction that happens at home. Parents should always be available to answer questions about their child's allergen. Tell them it's okay to contact you in these situations so you can help problem solve. Encourage open and clear communication and take time to answer questions carefully to make sure they understand the information and feel supported. Even if, someone's, even if something seems obvious to you, such as reading all food labels every time or not sharing cutting boards or utensils, remember that this is not necessarily obvious to someone else, so be careful not to make assumptions. Speak in a calm manner and use tools to guide your conversations like the publication I mentioned before, Anaphylaxis in Schools and Other Settings, or any of our other back-to-school resources, including our back-to-school checklist that you can find on our website. You should explain that although food allergies are serious, they can be managed. Be careful about the language that you use. It can be very tempting to use scary words and high emotion, but this often has a negative effect. People may think that you're overreacting and they may feel uncomfortable about taking care of your child. It's also important that your child may be listening to what you say about their food allergy. If you need to review some information that may be uncomfortable or scary for your child to hear, choose a time to discuss this when your child is not around. When you think about all the people who are in contact with your child, from grandparents to teachers and everybody in between, it brings to mind the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think this is very true. It's easy to assume when you start this journey that your family and friends will be behind you and they will understand your approach to managing food allergy. In some cases, it may take a lot of patient education, explaining, and perhaps some negotiation for them to really understand how to support your child. If these conversations don't go smoothly, it can be easy to react strongly. So enter into these conversations when the atmosphere is calm and there's plenty of time for discussion. Don't be surprised what people think they understand. They may have been exposed to many common myths that circulate. For, exa for example, the, the most common one I can think of is the smell of peanut butter can cause an allergic reaction, or a little bit won't hurt, or epinephrine is a cure, so what's the big deal, or that there's a hierarchy of allergens and only peanuts can cause harm. These are situations where using a medically approved resource can be especially helpful to help guide these conversations. So let's turn our attention to some practical tips now. As we get ready to go back to school, it's time to gather a multitude of school items and allergy related ones are no exception. In this picture, we can see some of the more common items, and it's not an exhaustive collection that I've shown in this picture here. So here we can see a standard emergency form or any other forms used by your school district. You can download a copy of this form from the Food Allergy Canada site. Please note that there are many jurisdictions that require a physician's signature on these documents, and these are important to get completed as they often are pertaining to permission to administer medication. So it's really important to get in to see your child's physician and get those signed so that there's no delay in the school having them. It is recommended that children carry one device when they're mature enough with another device in a central unlocked location. 
there are many options on the market that make carrying epinephrine easier and in this picture we can see an example of two different carrying cases and these are made of a soft neoprene type of material which generally make carrying uh, these items next to the skin or even on top of a t-shirt a bit more comfortable. You can see an example of wearable identification jewelry such as MedicAlert in this picture. And teaching, teachers often appreciate educational tools that can help them educate the children in the class. So here you can see a picture of a book and this, is, this can provide a great opportunity for learning about food allergy and how the children in the classroom can support their peers. And teachers are often happy to include these uh, to read to young children as a way of building empathy and reinforcing any classroom rules that may exist. Supplying the classroom teacher with a small amount of non-perishable treats can be, also be an option. And these cover unexpected events. Make sure that if you do um, provide any treats for the classroom, that they're well labeled with your child's information um, you know, clearly on the package. Be very clear about the non-negotiables, and these are always to have epinephrine readily available. If you don't have it available, then don't eat. Always make sure that um, always make sure of what um, your child is going to eat, and have med medication available at all times. If your child is old enough to self-carry. Ensure that they're wearing it any time that they are away from home. For children who are too young to carry, ensure that one dose is readily available in the location where your child will be, and a second dose is centrally located in a place such as an office. Make sure that these are never locked away and that everyone knows how to gain access to the medication just in case it's needed. Looking specifically at carrying and storage of epinephrine, again, find a comfortable and engaging carrying case for your child. Um, and they can begin to carry their auto-injector when you feel um, that the age is appropriate and their maturity level indicates um, that there is no uh, problem with them carrying it. Have your child help to pick out the style and the design so they feel included in this decision and they'll be more inclined to wear it if they've helped choose it. Epinephrine can be damaged by heat and by cold, so make sure not to sto store it in a car or a refrigerator. In the case of cold weather, keeping it in child, in, inside your child's coat um, is perfectly acceptable. Um, in hot weather, keep it in the shade. And the optimal temperature for storage is 15 to 30 degrees Celsius or 59 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure to share this information with your child's um, child care setting or the school personnel. Keep epinephrine out of the reach of very young children who may be curious and want to handle the device. To help you and your child remember to carry the auto-injector, use visual clues. And I think most food allergy parents um, do do some version of this. So hang it on a hook by the, uh, an external door and have it be part of the routine to put on your shoes, your jacket, your auto-injector, and then take them off when they come home. So clipping it onto their school backpack, for instance, and I have a quick picture of this on the next slide. Posting, it, posting a note on your front door um, or the alarm keypad with a reminder, for example, you've got EpiPen question mark, or using one of the apps that are available uh, as a reminder on your telephone. So basically, think about the strategies that will work for your family. I used to have a sign on the doorway into our garage because we drove our children to school. So in this picture, uh, you can see that the carrying case is clipped to the backpack. And the only additional step is to unclip the carrying case and clip it onto the child. Again, the recommendation is to have one device on the person when they are mature enough. So knowing how to recognize a reaction and the steps of the emergency plan, including how to use epinephrine, is vital. Anaphylaxis is not a common occurrence, but if everyone feels confident about the key steps involved, an emergency situation is likely to be less stressful and the action items such as administering epinephrine will not be delayed. So looking at emergency management, Here we see a graphic showing the symptoms of anaphylaxis. 
This graphic highlights the body systems that can be involved during an allergic reaction. So here we see the skin, respiratory, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, and neurological symptoms. It's important to know that anaphylaxis can occur without hives being present, and the way that the symptoms occur can vary from one person to another, and even from one reaction to another reaction in the same person. The, main, the, main, the most dangerous symptoms of an allergic reaction are any difficulty breathing or airway symptoms such as shortness of breath, chest pain, chest tightness, coughing, wheezing, throat tightness, hoarse voice, and or a drop of blood pressure, which is indicated by dizziness, lightheadedness, feeling faint or weak, a weak pulse, a change in skin color, which is characterized by paleness or a slight blue color or any loss of consciousness. During an emergency, it's best to have the person in a position of safety, and this would be lying down or sitting with support. This helps prevent accidental falls and it can be helpful to also support or brace the leg of a young child to reduce any potential movement. After you've used epinephrine, place your child on their back with their legs raised, as you can see in the top picture. Place something under their legs for support, like a couple of pillows, a backpack, or a small stool. This helps to reduce the symptoms of shock and improves the blood flow to the vital organs of the body, which are the heart, the lungs, and the brain. If they feel sick or are vomiting or there's any change to their level of consciousness, place them on their side in the recovery position or semi-prone position so that the airway is clear and they do not choke on vomit. Most importantly, their airway stays uh, open and patent. If your child is finding it difficult to breathe, they may prefer to be in a more upright position. However, if breathing is not an immediate concern, keep them lying down and don't move them into a sitting or standing position until a doctor can assess their blood pressure. The reason that body positioning is so important is because sudden changes of position into an upright position can cause a dangerous drop of blood pressure and potentially increase the risk of a fatality. The emergency treatment of anaphylaxis includes these five steps. One, give epinephrine at the start of a known or suspected reaction. Epinephrine should be injected into the muscle on the mid outer thigh of the thigh. Call 911 or local emergency medical services and tell them that someone is having an anaphylactic reaction. Stay with your child while waiting for the ambulance. Get another person to show the paramedics where your child is. Three, give a second dose of epinephrine as early as five minutes after the first dose if there is no improvement in symptoms or if the symptoms come back. Four, go to the nearest hospital immediately, ideally by ambulance, even if the symptoms are mild or they have stopped. The paramedic should take your child to the ambulance by stretcher. Avoid sitting up or standing up until an assessment has been done in the emergency department. Typically, a stay in the emergency department will last approximately four to six hours, but the emergency room physician will determine the length of stay. Five, if your child's at a daycare or school, emergency treatment should be initiated first, including calling 911, and then followed up by a phone call to you. If you are with your child, it's important to remain calm. Your child will feel less anxious if they see that you're in control. Epinephrine helps to address the symptoms of anaphylaxis by opening up the airways and improving blood pressure and accelerating the heart rate. Delay in using epinephrine increases the risk of negative outcomes. After someone receives epinephrine, they should go to hospital for further treatment and assessment, preferably by ambulance. Epinephrine is very safe to use for the treatment of anaphylaxis in almost all individuals, and the only exception to this would be people at the extremes of age and those with hypertension, peripheral vascular or ischemic heart disease, or untreated hyperthyroidism. People with these conditions should talk to their doctor about using epinephrine, but when in doubt and if there's an emergency, go ahead and use epinephrine. Whenever possible, it's best to have two auto-injectors available in case a second dose is required. At this time, EpiPen is the only auto-injector available in Canada.
EpiPen contains a single pre-measured dose of epinephrine, and the product comes in two different strengths. EpiPen with the yellow label that you can see here on the slide with the yellow case is a dose of 0.3 milligrams, and this is for adults and children weighing 30 kilograms, which is approximately 66 pounds or greater. EpiPen Junior with the green level has a dose of 0.15 milligrams, and this is for children weighing 15 to 30 kgs or around 33 to 66 pounds. EpiPen has a training device available. They are very similar to the real device, but they don't contain a needle or medication, and you can get those from the EpiPen website. It's important to store a training device separately from real devices to avoid any confusion during an emergency. You can visit EpiPen.ca um, to request a training device be sent to you, but you could also sign up for their expiry reminder service where they send you an email to remind you that your EpiPen is, ex is about to expire. For children who fall below 15 kilograms in weight, usually it's the smaller dose, 0.15 milligrams, that is used for these children. This should be discussed with an allergist or your child's physician, and you can find more information that's available about this on the EpiPen website. If you have a training device with you, you can walk through the steps with me. So as in the first picture, hold firmly with the orange tip pointing downwards. And a good um, you remove the blue safety kit cap by pulling straight up. You don't need to bend it or twist it. And as soon, um, as, soon as the blue safety cap is removed, the unit is live and ready to go. This is a picture of the training device being used in the main picture. So place and push the orange tip firmly into the mid outer thigh until you hear a click. And hold on the thigh for several seconds. Many people find it very uh, helpful to actually uh, count to 10. It, it helps you keep the auto injector placed on the thigh. When the EpiPen is removed, the orange needle cover automatically extends to cover the needle. And you can see that in the smaller picture. This means that the needle is never exposed or seen. The next action item following the administration of epinephrine is to call 911 or local emergency services and for the person to be taken to the closest emergency, uh, emergency department. There are several publications and online resources where you can find out more information and these are great tools and can be used to enhance your own knowledge and can help educate family, friends and caregivers. And these include the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, Food Allergy Canada's websites including the main website, the newly diagnosed support centre and Why Risk It. Allergy Aware free online training tools as I mentioned before it has three training uh, opportunities, one for the community, one for childcare settings, and one for schools. And the Allergic Living magazine and its website are all extremely good uh, places to find more information. I'd like to thank our sponsors for this webinar, Pfizer Canada, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, and the Peanut Bureau of Canada. So today we've covered some of the tips to prepare for going back to school. I want to encourage you to attend other webinars on a variety of subjects or our small group sessions which focus on the newly diagnosed phase, including our parent mentor-led sessions which run twice a week at varying times. Please take a visit to our um, events calendar on our website and you can see all of the offerings that we have online. As I mentioned before, there are also webinars specifically for children on topics such as back to school, which is this month, and of course in October the topic is Halloween. Again, find more information by looking at our events calendar. I'd now like to focus on some of the questions that have come in. Um, so Stephanie, you, um, you yes. can start with the questions now. Okay, for our first question, we have, how do you suggest schools deal with multiple food allergies? Their tendency is to try to ban all food allergens. Can you comment on that? We, we, have, um, <laughs> we know that banning all food allergens is not practical, especially now um, when many classrooms have children with opposing food allergens. And we also know that um, you know, this becomes quite difficult and can cause um, some backlash. 
We also, I think it's important to point out that we, uh, the allergic uh, families and the children um, that are at school or in a daycare, we also need the cooperation and the support of the non-allergic community. So it's not sustainable to restrict multiple items because the non-allergic um, children do need um, to be able to bring items to school for lunch. So all strategies that um, that I suggested in the uh, presentation will have to be developed based on the age of the children, the structure of the school, the number of the allergens that are being in, uh, avoided in any classroom. And I, and I think it's really worth pointing out that each situation is different. Um, we have to aim for allergy aware and pay attention to the strategies that reduce the risk. And by these, I, I did go over this in the, the, um, the slides, you know, training and education for staff and responsible adults who, who have authority over children, general communication at a, at a classroom level and a school level, um, drilling down to important things like symptom recognition um, after you've done everything to reduce the risk that is um, symptom recognition and using epinephrine is, is extremely important. Again, the best tool um, uh, to teach when your child is old enough is not to accept foods from others that you haven't approved. Um, you can provide a safe bag of treats for your child and leave that with your teacher um, and tell your child about it, make sure it's clearly labeled. Um, you know, in this way, any surprise treats that are brought into cl the classroom, your child can have something safe to enjoy. I, I know that there's a really good strategy used by a lot of parents, and that is to actually ask the teacher uh, to request uh, from the other parents in the classroom, you know, that they, they alert the teacher and give them as much notice, maybe 24 hours notice from parents, if they're going to be bringing in treats, say for birthdays or something into the classroom, so that allergic parents can actually have a bit of time to provide an alternate treat uh, for their child if, if that, um, you know, set of cupcakes or treats will, will exclude that child. Um, I think you have to be available to the teacher to provide suggestions about safe snacks that can be enjoyed by the whole class for parties. And I, and I think actually this has a knock-on effect of reducing the stress and the workload for the teacher as well um, you know, as them trying to manage a classroom full of uh, opposing and different allergens. Um, some teachers may decide to restrict all food in the classroom for health reasons. Um, I, I've certainly seen this to reduce sh uh, sugar, um, excesses of sugar that's coming into the classroom and junk food. And you know, this is a great approach as well. Um, if there's food being consumed in the classroom, ask about hand washing protocol and surface cleaning um, and how that will be um, handled. Uh, you know, to the common surfaces. Um, I think those are, um, you know, the top strategies. And I, and I think it really does differ um, between very young children who are still putting their hands in their mouths uh, versus uh, teenagers, for instance. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is tips for children with anaphylaxis going into kindergarten for the first time. Some, some tips that we can teach them. Yeah, this tends to be, um, you know, one of the first times where, um, you know, we hear from parents, um, it, it causes quite a bit of anxiety, sort of handing over the responsibility uh, of your child into, um, really, into a stranger, into the kindergarten environment. So, um, these, are, these are really the same rules for all children with food allergy. You just have to teach, reinforce, get buy-in um, from responsible adults, involve your child and explain why allergy rules uh, are really important and explain it in a way that they can, they can understand, obviously age and maturity wise. Be honest and open about uh, the questions that children ask, but, but pitch your answers so that they can understand and ask open-ended questions to make sure that they understand what you've, what you've taught them. Um, make sure that it's okay for your child to talk about any mistakes that they've made or when allergy rules weren't followed. These are incredibly valuable teaching moments and your child should not be worried about being punished um, you know, if they've made a mistake. They're, they're valuable uh, teaching moments. 
You can have them where they're auto-injector uh, as soon as your child is ready, uh, as long as they're not tempted to, uh, you know, open it up and uh, uh, play with it. You can role-play with them about what they would do if uh, a peer tried to take their EpiPen out and play with it, for example. You know, you have to sort of think ahead of the game um, to all the potential things that could happen and arm your child with a way to respond. Uh, explain to them there, there will be times uh, where food is brought into a classroom that they cannot eat safely and tell them uh, that you leave treats especially for them uh, with the teacher for those occasions or that you'll make them a special treat when they come home from school. So, you know, this, this happens all too frequently. So it, it's best to have that conversation with your child and just, just make sure they understand, you know, that it may happen. Um, there will likely be times when your child may feel left out um, because certain food um, has been brought into an event at school. So, you know, at these times, you know, it's really important to listen to them and ask them, um, engage them in problem solving. What could make them feel better? Um, there's no easy way, but most schools across Canada have um, information and policies about inclusion. And, you know, I would certainly turn people's attention to those policies because an inclusive um, atmosphere at school is is really the gold standard in Canadian schools. And, uh, you know, we should we should strive uh, for that, um, even if it is a situation where there's an unsafe uh, celebration and the food is not safe for your child, at least if you have some notice by the school that this is going to take place, you'll have the opportunity to actually um, prepare something for your child so that they can partake of the celebration, not necessarily the food. Okay, our next question is, do you have any pointers for families with a teenager about to start high school? Uh, oh, well, high school is a, certainly a different environment from uh, elementary, and I would strongly recommend that that uh, parents uh, take time and put some effort into that transition uh, piece. You know, children will move around to various classrooms. There's going to be uh, more than one teacher. It depends on the on the setup of the high school, but when my daughter was at school, she all of a sudden had six responsible adults um, who were going to be teaching her. Um, kids often leave the school grounds and that's not optimal but they do do it so problem solve and have discussions with your children about uh, leaving the school grounds and also cafeterias uh, are seen for the first time usually in a high school setting so you as the parent could go and see if there's a safe option and, and see what the landscape looks like in the cafeteria while remembering that it's extremely important for teens to hang out with other teens so um, in, in my example of what I did is I visited the cafeteria and I actually um, found out that she could have a drink and she could have um, a small snack and we identified what that was and therefore she could actually go into the cafeteria and hang out as long as she sort of stuck to the rules of, of what she could have. So reinforcing rules and, and expected behavior is really important. Um, I think that teenagers should learn to own their own emergency plan. I think that they should fully understand the steps of their plan and make sure that they can use their auto injector if if they're uh, if they can. Obviously, you know, some some of the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis can overwhelm a person pretty quickly, but I do think that teenagers need to know how to use their auto injector so that if they can, they can use it. Um, most teenagers have uh, a cell phone, but I, I, I do think that having a cell phone so that your teen can talk to you if they need to, I, I think that's uh, uh, a really good option. I also really like the idea of peer education and support. So if kids are uh, moving from a high, uh, from an elementary uh, school up into high up into high school together, it's obviously better. But if there are multiple elementary schools feeding into one high school. Um, you know, to have some kind of peer education and support would be ideal, especially if there's kids who've never um, had exposure to a classmate who has food allergy. I think it's uh, it's definitely better to have more awareness and uh, for food allergy certainly not to be a secret. It should be discussed and, and awareness should be um, 
um, done with all students and all adults in a high school setting. I think we have to also remember not to leave out specific people like coaches um, who travel with kids and also prepare for longer field trips. I mean, my children both played basketball, so there were sometimes a three-day long uh, trip to tournaments. So, you know, a lot of preparation has to go into those sort of, um, um, those adventures uh, at high school. Great. Um, how, to, how do we ensure a child's safety while eating lunch in the gym with a large group of kids and one lunch supervisor? Yes, well, and just to, you know, some schools have taken this approach to have, um, you know, to, for everybody to have lunch in the gym, and it really depends on the allergens that are being avoided and what the specific rules are. I've heard a bit of everything, that everybody has lunch in the gym and there's an allergy table or there's a table that is for peers to eat together. I've, I've heard a bit of everything. So there's the answer, the quick answer is it depends, really. Um, I think that uh, you know sometimes children would feel more comfortable if they were, for instance, sitting at the end of the table so that they can control their sort of space um, a little bit better and they don't feel uh, crammed in. Um, they should know what to do if they feel that, for instance, their lunch has been contaminated in some way. They should know to be able to speak to the lunch supervisor. You can role play with them about what they would do if, if for whatever reason they were made uncomfortable. Um, I think uh, it's very important for your child to identify allies among their peer group uh, that can also help uh, if they're needed. Um, I think it all boils down to your child's safety procedures, so hand washing before and after eating, eating from their lunchbox or on a paper towel or grease proof paper, eating only what you send and not being tempted to, uh, to share food. Um, you know, over lunch is, you know, it's it's a sort of a multifactorial approach, really. Great. Next question is, how do we decrease risk of contact reactions? For example, kindergartners eating yogurt tubes. Are hand wipes enough? Um, I think the greatest risk of having an allergic reaction is with ingestion. So good surface cleaning in this kind of situation, yes, we all know young children can be very messy. Um, Hand washing is ideal, but I I understand that um, you know having 35 young children line up for hand washing is 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 uh, is often a problem in the school setting. Uh, so you know I would say the gold standard is hand washing before and after eating. Um, learning to keep fingers out of the mouth generally. There have been milder reactions that have happened due to skin contact, but they're normally mild and not usually anaphylaxis. Um, the caveat to this would be, of course, broken skin, which could be problematic in this type of situation. So if your child has eczema, especially on their hands, um, you know, take steps for eczema to be as controlled as best you can and seek medical assistance uh, you know, in situations where eczema is um, severe or it is persistent. Um, hand washing, again, you know, is really the best with warm water and soap. Uh, the next best effective way to get rid of allergens off of your hands is hand wipes. And importantly, hand sanitizers do not remove allergens. So um, hand washing is best, surface cleaning, obviously, um, keeping your fingers out of your mouths. This can be very trying for young children, but that's the best if we can make it happen. And um, just remembering that hand wipes are... Um, you know, the next best option, but sand, uh, sand sanitizers or gels, um, you know, generally they, they are not supported for use to remove allergens. Okay, uh, how often can I follow up or check in on classroom management to ensure agreed protocols are being followed? Mm, gosh, that's a tough one. I, I don't think that there's any standard out there. I guess I would say that um, you well first of all build a good rapport uh, with the staff at the school um, and position yourself 
you know, as a source of, of good information. But I guess I would say that you can gauge what's happening by talking to your child. They like to tell you what happened in a day. And certainly, uh, in my experience, they, they certainly like to tell you about anything that bothered them or caused them any anxiety in the school setting. So, you know, that may be enough. But I think it's also worth periodically checking in with the teacher to th see how things are going, see if she feels um, everything, if there's any problems that she's noticed. Um, I think I, I would. Uh, I think you have to follow your gut reaction on this, and I think if the main pieces of risk reduction are in place, and I'm talking again, I sound a bit like a broken record about this, but training and education. Um, that risk reduction protocols are happening in a classroom, that your child's got medication. Um, if all of those things are in place, um, you know, I don't think um, just popping your head around the door at the end of the day just to check in with the, the teacher is a bad thing, but I think you should have confidence that um, things are going well unless you're hearing differently uh, from your child. You can ask open-ended questions. But, um, you know, I think it's extremely important to have a good rapport and a good relationship with the teacher. And, um, yes, I, I just don't think there's a standard, but um, having a good relationship and a friendly check-in is, is perfectly okay. Great. Um, what about helping my child explain the allergy to other children? Any tips? Well, I think this can be done in a, you know, obviously pitching information to children in an age-appropriate way. Um, I think having somebody come in and do a presentation, whether, you know, it differs all over the country. In, in some areas, um, nurses go into school, um, some parents go into school to do a presentation or read a story. I think, um, I think that's a, a very common way of explaining to the broader community. As I mentioned before, books and videos are available that a teacher can use um, that help um, child, uh, a child explain uh, their food allergy. You can also, Food Allergy Canada, I think I mentioned this before, has a challenge, uh, a food allergy challenge for both elementary and high school. And they have lesson plans and activities that can help answer some of these lessons. Kyle Dine has a really great video uh, with sort of puppets, um, which which is really engaging for younger kids. Um, and I think really it boils down to helping them practice with role playing at home using planned explanations. Um, sometimes this makes kids feel quite empowered. Um, you know, I think you have to sort of test this out with your own child. Um, I, I find young children very accepting. Oh, you know, you you know they just accept. Um, these things about their friends. My friend has food allergy, and and that's just sort of accepted as a as a fact of life. Other other children want to sort of know what that is around the the child's waist. So I think you have to you have to um, practice, anticipate sort of common situations and role play. So your child, you know, is not found out of their depth. That they they can immediately call to mind uh, the right thing to say at the right time. All right. Um, also, we have a question here about teenagers with allergies and staying safe while dating. That's a big one. <laughs> oh, the lovely teenagers, yes. Um, can you tell I've had two of them? Well, all um, actually, all the allergy rules still apply. Um, knowing what you're eating and the other risk reduction measures, uh, being able to give your own epinephrine, having it ready. Um, in addition, so turning the attention directly towards dating, um, there needs to be a conversation with the person um, that your child's in, that your child intends to kiss. And I'm I'm not talking about uh, a conversation with you, the parent talking. I, I think that we have to prepare, you know, our youngster to have that conversation. I've known kids who've had that conversation, and they use humor, or they um, you know, they use other strategies. Um, uh, I was talking to my daughter about this actually yesterday, and uh, she said that some of her boyfriends at high school decided that, well, some, it sounds like she had loads, but one or two of them uh, said, well, I'm just not going to eat your allergens. 
and and that was great and they also practice strategies like uh, label reading sometimes you know with quite a lot of uh, energy they were reading labels um, you know the same as my daughter would they were washing their hands and as I said they avoided the allergens I think probably because they wanted to kiss uh, my daughter but um, also things like brushing uh, their teeth and having detailed uh, oral hygiene prior to kissing these are all very important strategies and uh, you know, and I think you know these conversations can be extremely awkward, and your teen will need your support to, um, again, you know, have, you know, these uh, be able to have recall to the right things to say at the right time, um, and I think actually this is a, a great uh, piece in the ultimate guidebook. I was looking at it yesterday, and there's um. I think it was chapter 12 was all about dating so um, the ultimate guidebook as I said I absolutely love this book I think it's a fantastic resource uh, for teenagers and it does address kissing and some strategies that kids have uh, found uh, effective so um, yeah that's all about dating and, and kissing Stephanie, do we have another question? Sorry, Laura, I had muted myself. <laughs> um, so we have about five minutes left, so we probably have time for just a couple more questions. We actually had one that just came in regarding medical alert or identification bracelets for teens um, and whether there's any data to support you know, the importance of their use for allergies. I'm wondering if you comment as have a parent of you know, young adults. Oh. And so, so the what the question was: Is there any data to support data to support their use? For, yeah, that, for allergies. Um, okay. Well, my mind is going blank, of course, right now. Is there any data? There may be, but I I can't pull it to the top of my list. But do do you get a sense? That the question is more about um, how do you how do you um, how do you get children to wear their medical alert when Maybe they're more, teen? more if they're you know they have been proven to be helpful for people who oh, I think I, I think there's no doubt that that having a medical or ID is is very helpful um, you know there may be a situation where you know you have a compromised airway where somebody's finding it difficult to breathe or um, they've got a swollen you know some some part of their airway is swollen or you know they're overcome by their um, by their symptoms and, and especially important in the high school sort of arena where you might actually you know find somebody um, who, who's experiencing problems but the teacher who finds that person may not know that student so if the person could find a medical or ID on them that's going to be extremely helpful um, you know so Yes, I, I don't see any, I, I see the bigger problem actually being getting teenagers to wear their medical or ID. Um, you know, that to me is the opportunity to get your teenager to choose it. My daughter for a lot of years in high school chose to wear a necklace. Uh, she felt it was more discreet. She did not want it on her armband. But then in the later grades, I think probably grade 10, uh, she decided um, you know, that she wanted one that looked like a sports band and she was okay with wearing that uh, on her wrist. Um, so um, you know, I think the bigger issue is, uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt that wearing medical or ID is, is very, very important for reducing the risk. But I think the bigger struggle that parents will have is, is getting buy-in from their students. Um, so do whatever you can. Involve kids in, in what they think is cool. Because I can tell you, it's a, as an older person, um, I've been told regularly that I don't know what's cool anymore. So get your child's buy-in. Um, I think it is extremely helpful. Okay, I'm wondering if we have time to just do one last question sure. regarding teacher training and how to tactfully determine their ability to assess and handle an anaphylactic emergency. Okay, I used to ask questions about um, education and training um, at, when my, my child was at school. I used to ask who does your training at the school, uh, when does it happen? It's really helpful uh, when you know these factors so everybody can be on the same page. So make sure to ask these questions uh, of the administration at the beginning of every year. 
So if it's a public health nurse, and, and who does training in schools varies uh, across the country, but if it's a public health nurse, you could be in touch with your public health nurse at your um, public health unit to discuss any concerns that you may have. Um, you can ask them what information they, they're using to train the teachers. Do they bring uh, auto-injector training pens? Do they teach about body positioning and the importance of early introduction? You know, I think these, these are things that will actually make people feel, parents feel a little bit more um, reassured if they know what's being taught. Uh, if someone in charge of your child tells you that they've been trained to use or they've been trained uh, how to deal with an emergency situation, um, you know, don't, don't feel bad about asking them to walk you through what an, an, an allergic emergency would look like at their school. Um, you know, they should be able to say, well, this is, this is our emergency uh, procedure. So I think these are um, all appropriate questions to ask. All right, um, we are at 11 o'clock now, at least in Western Canada. Yeah, <laughs> time flies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, it's 11 o'clock. Thanks everybody for attending our webinar. We hope that you found the information helpful and useful. You're going to be sent a short survey that you will receive through GoToWebinar in the next hour or so. So if you could, please take a moment to complete it. Your feedback is really important to us and it helps us to develop content for future presentations. If you have any additional questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're here to help. Um, so we love to hear from you actually. Um, this is now the end of our time with you today and Stephanie, Stephanie and I want to thank you very much for attending and we hope that you have a great afternoon or in the case if you're in Western Canada, uh, the, a great rest of the morning and day. So thank you everybody. Goodbye. Bye.